I'm going to ask Brenda to come up here now. <laughs> uh, I can do that to Brenda. Other people can't. But, uh. <clears throat> well, it's good to see everybody out this morning. And um, we're going to be talking about did Jesus really rise from the dead this morning uh, from the text that we've been uh, looking at. And before we do that, let's go ahead and, and uh, start with a prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we're very thankful to you that we were able to worship this morning, that we were able to take the Lord's Supper, and that we are now here to further uh, discuss uh, the topic of Jesus and him raising from the dead, and the way that the atheist looks at it, and the skeptic, and the world, and to help us, Father, navigate uh, better discussions with those who are not believers, who are struggling with these concepts. We pray, Father, that the things we learn in this class will... will Help us in those conversations uh, to be able to, to declare our faith and tell other people about the hope that's in us and why we believe uh, the way that we believe. Uh, help us this morning and be with all of us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so did Jesus really rise from the dead? <clears throat> Gary, <clears throat> excuse my voice here. <clears throat> Let me clear that. Gary Habermas. <clears throat> He is a historian and a philosopher. He has got a PhD. He's a very smart guy. Um, I encourage you to watch. I should have probably sent some of his videos out. I encourage you to watch some of his videos and, and visit his website. He's, he's an authority on the uh, resurrection of Jesus. There's no doubt he's, he's covered a lot of ground. He's written several books and co-authored like over 40 books, numerous articles. And there's a quote in our, our textbook from him that uh, says that skeptics must provide more than an alternative theories to the resurrection. They must provide first century evidence for those theories. And this is going to become really the heart and soul, I think, of a lot of the arguments you hear and the things that skeptics will say. Um, and so I just kind of wrote myself down a reminder. I'm going to try to say it as often as I can in this class, but where is your evidence it is a fair question. In a very kind way. Okay, I hear what you're saying. However, where is your evidence? <clears throat> so when it comes to the resurrection, what do the scholars say? It's, you really should watch some of his videos. I, there were some things I did not know um, about how this has changed since the 70s and, and how influential he was on some of the, the thoughts and the processes. And I, he made a comment about how we have this idea that skeptics um, don't believe anything about the Bible or anything in the Bible or that the Bible's even real, it's all false, and that's not true. Uh, skeptics who don't believe in Jesus, who are scholars and who study this, they absolutely believe. And he brought up this point, which was amazing. There are seven of, of all people of Paul's documents that everybody pretty much agrees are authentic, that they're from the man known as Paul, and uh, six of them are very significant. And I watched him work back that we have an eyewitness that's within two years in Paul, um, you, know, you know, in a very short time span, when Jesus himself tells him and meets him on the road to Damascus. It's, it's a very powerful argument. I wish I could explain it as well as he can, but uh, he did, but I'm going to send the link out that I found this on. It's an amazing argument that's made. Um, he's written this book, though. <clears throat> And it's called The Risen Jesus and the Future Hope. And we've talked about some of this already. There's 12 facts that they're all in agreement on. And I think this is a good place to start that when you're going to be talking to someone who doesn't, doesn't really understand it or someone who does understand it, they're going to know these things. There are 12 things that when you read this historical account known as the Bible in the New Testament and what's been written, the idea that Jesus died by Roman, cru Roman crucifixion, they're all going to say, absolutely. The historians agree with this fact. This is number one. All right? So that's something they can all wrap their head around. Now, when I say that, you need to understand, they're not going to say that that means that he really did die. They're going to say that, yes, this historical document that's this old and has all this, that that is true. And we've already been talking about how that's our evidence and, and why that's important. So they may say, yeah, but he didn't really die. But yes, that is an old document, and it's clear, just so we understand that part. He was buried in a private tomb. There's no doubt that the historical account, what I would call it a, a journalist approach or writing biographies, that type of thing, that 
he is buried in a, in a private tomb. Absolutely, they all are in agreement with that. The disciples lost hope initially. And when that comes out in the text, we see them get discouraged. They, they were dreaming about something here and believing in Jesus, and he dies. And they do. They, they lose hope soon afterwards. And Jesus' tomb was found empty very soon after his burial. And we know that account, and they're all going to, what did I just do, Herb? No, it's, oh. it's just incredible that they agree to that. That's oh, awesome. yeah, they, the, the, the tomb is empty, but this is the class. You're going to see why they believe in this, <laughs> or what they say. Disciples believe that they saw the risen Jesus. After he died, they believe that he rose and that they saw him. That those accounts, <clears throat> they believe that those accounts are, are true. <clears throat> First Corinthians 2 is one of the main Books that they look at and they go, yeah, th this, this is a historical guy, a scholar writing this. They just, they're not, they're going to say that's not true, but they do believe that the document is accurate in what it's portraying and what it's reporting and what, and what it's saying. This should give us, you see where the argument goes really quick. This should give us some confidence as we get further into this. Disciples, they live transformed lives. It, th what happened changed the way they lived. I mean, Paul's the number one example, right? What happened to him uh, how his life was changed. Uh, the proclamation of the resurrection took place very early from the beginning of church history. They're going to start talking about the resurrection immediately. You know, and they're all in agreement that, yeah, when you read these documents, this was the talk and the buzz around town and around the world. And the disciples' public testimony and preaching of the resurrection took place in the city of Jerusalem where Jesus had been crucified and buried. So everything is happening around Jerusalem. All the stuff that we believe you know, to be absolutely true and from God, the one who created everything, they're saying that this historical document, I don't think they think we're really stupid for believing this because there's a lot of things written about it. It's going to be their criticism of what we're reading. The gospel focused on the death and, and the resurrection, and it centered around that and the preaching of his death, just kind of like what... Brian just spoke a little bit ago. Uh, Sunday was the primary day for gathering and worshiping. James, the brother of Jesus, was a skeptic before this, and he was actually converted and was no longer a skeptic. And then just a few years later, Saul of Tarsus became a Christian and a believer due to an experience that he, be that he believed happened to him. And that's the way they would put it, that he believed happened to him on the road to Damascus. They are going to agree that, yeah, he really believes this happened to him. Well, I agree with that, too. But I also believe what Paul believed. I believe that did happen to Paul. I think he's telling it accurately. So it's within that kind of idea that they start the argument. Are there any questions about this up to this point or any comments that, that you'd like to bring up at this point? Okay. No one wants a microphone this morning. All right. So pretty simple stuff. This is the 12. That's a lot when you think about it. When you're having a conversation, and if you're talking to someone who is unaware of this, you need to make them aware. And a lot of people say, oh, but the scholars say that this is not true. It's when you start looking at, is that really what they're saying? You're going to be surprised, not, not so much the way you think it is. They are saying some stuff, but not in the way it's sometimes thought of. All right. <clears throat> the other thing to note is... Um, the legend idea. The New Testament story is not a legend. All right? And um, yeah, Herb's laughing because he knows what a legend is. And th this, is, this is important. When you look at something, the New Testament is meticulously written with the intent to be accurate. All right? Uh, the documents were written well within two generations of the events by the eyewitnesses or their contemporaries. And the New Testament storyline is confirmed also by non-Christian writers. The New Testament mentions at least 30 historical figures who have been confirmed by sources outside the New Testament that they're real you know, sources. And therefore, the New Testament really cannot be a legend. When you look at this, you have uh, historical detail. Um, you know, we're going to compare this to Robin Hood, uh, obviously. The, the legend of Robin Hood, it lacks precise historical details and subject variation. Uh, there's the eyewitness testimony. Um, the Bible is written by eyewitnesses when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus. But Robin Hood originates from oral tradition and lacks direct eyewitness testimony. There, there really isn't any. There's uh, early composition. So when the things happen with Jesus very close to the event, 
the truth about Robin Hood is that Robin Hood is set in the time period of the late uh, 1200s, yet the writings don't start till like the 1400s. So there's this big gap before it even comes. It's a, it's a legend. He's English folklore. And um, it's, it's, it's got other a aspects to it, like the historical confirmation. Uh, the Robin Hood lacks that. There is no substantial confirmation. But Jesus, on the other hand, is supported by non-Christian sources, by archaeological, by archaeological, and by eyewitnesses. Jesus has a lot more confirmation along these lines. There's consistency and cohesion uh, in Jesus because he exhibits this consistent. Everybody's saying the same thing. Everybody believes the same thing. We still believe the same thing that was written, you know, thousands of years ago. It hasn't changed for us. We're not moving on it. The the story that we believe is the same. But Robin Hood, on the other hand, I mean, you know, it would only be just another year or so, I'm sure, before there's another take on, on Robin Hood. The story of Robin Hood changes over time. And, um, you know, even Mel Brooks has a version <laughs> of Robin Hood. You know, everybody can, can, can pile on to this type of, of legend. And um, now, when it comes to the impact on history, just be honest, has any character changed the world more than Jesus. In history, this has had the largest impact on cultures and people. Robin Hood, on the other hand, you know, there is an ideal of, you know, yeah, you know, take from those rich people and give it to the poor people. In certain cultures, you know, Robin Hood's a, uh, I see why the legend exists. And, you know, it's, a, it's one of those stories that, that can make you feel good. The other thing is, uh, is the New Testament story. Brian touched on, on uh, somebody accusing him of, of a lie. The New Testament story is not a lie. It includes unusual and embarrassing details. That idea is that why would the New Testament writers write something that was embarrassing to tell about themselves if they were lying? They would put a spin on it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Brian talked about some of this. Separating Jesus' words uh, from their own uh, and indicating an attempt to accurately convey his message. Referring to the facts and people who saw things, the writers referred to facts and eyewitnesses, accounts that their readers could verify. Uh, they invited scrutiny and investigation into these things to see that they are so. Um, the New Testament writers challenged readers and adversaries to investigate their claims, to indicate uh, confidence in their truthfulness of what they were actually saying in their accounts. And people who saw Jesus, um, they died for their beliefs. And I like the point Brian made up because I think I've actually said people don't die for a lie. And Brian brought up Wednesday that they don't die for a lie knowing it's a lie. There is a difference. You know, they may be deceived. And that's important for this discussion because that's going to come up as well. So there's the lie part, and then there's the truth part. <clears throat> and the question is, is, is the New Testament true? Well, most scholars are going to agree that to those 12 facts we mentioned earlier. Um, they accept seven of Paul's documents without hesitation. The New Testament story is not a legend. It's not a lie, and I think I'm supposed to be. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm on the right page. Um, but I will jump to this. The skeptic has one more play here, though. Perhaps the New Testament writers were deceived. Now, this word perhaps, I just want to tell you that that should be a, a, um, a flag. Uh, this was just a note. Ann and I have seen this in some of the stuff we've watched. Perhaps life grew on the back of crystals, as an actual quote from, from some of you might know. Perhaps. This word perhaps is used a lot. And so I have weird books like Bad Arguments. And, and so I thought, you know, what is perhaps? And so I looked it up in my bad argument book, and, um, and it is a uh, fallacious argument. It's the red herring, speculative assertion, and ad hoc hypothesis, depending on how, how they're using it. Perhaps is really meant to kill the conversation. And you watch it when it's, you know, in other words, <clears throat> you lay out all this evidence, and you show them all these things, and, and they don't respond. Instead, they say, well, perhaps this other thing happened. All right. I think that the answer to this is a really simple question. What I mentioned at the beginning is, what's your, your evidence? So I want to look at the way this is approached. And we need to remember number five. Disciples believed they saw the risen Jesus. 
as we go through this. That was point number five out of the 12 points. They believed this. All right, so perhaps the New Testament writers were deceived. Perhaps the New Testament writers were simply wrong about what they thought they saw. And this is the two things that are being pitted against themselves. So how do skeptics then explain away the resurrection? And before we talk about this, one more thing to remember. We should be skeptical about skeptical theories. And, and listen to them closely and then ask a very simple question. All right, so number one was uh, the hallucination theory. Perhaps, perhaps they were just hallucinating. The idea of them just hallucinating what they were seeing when they saw the, the risen Lord has some serious problems. But do you all remember the dream we all had together last night? You remember that, how we were all dreaming that John Cagle and Dave Crowder were coming down floating on, on, on big marshmallows, and Amy runs out with some graham crackers, and, and Jared hooked them with a big butterfly net, and, and we brought them all in. You all remember this, right? The dream we all had together last night, <clears throat> and then we made s'mores, and it was great. You know, this, that's what's wrong with this hallucination theory, is that it's, it's got this thing where everybody is hallucinating together. Well, that's like saying everybody dreams the same dream together. And you would, if I said that to you, you all would be going, Tim, that didn't happen. You're out of your mind. That didn't happen. Were the disciples deceived by hallucinations? Well, the first question I'm going to ask somebody who brings this up is, where is your evidence? Do you have evidence of that anywhere? Where is this idea and this concept coming from. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about group hallucination. If all those people really saw Jesus in their minds, why didn't the people in charge just show Jesus' body to them if we're talking about the empty tomb? They were all hallucinating that the tomb was empty. Well, that's easy to fix. You know, they're, all, they're all hallucinating the death. They're all hallucinating all sorts of stuff. This one, well, so in the first lesson that Brian did, he did this really cool chart of, of uh, the gap, um, what faith is, and the percentage of faith and evidence in 100% proof. Um, I'd like to say, well, this is good evidence. We'll, we'll add some evidence here, but I have to ignore this evidence and go to the next one. Having said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. You know, as we go through this, I want to show events where people saw Jesus after he had risen. They talked to him, and, he, and they heard him, and some of them touch him. They're not hallucinating. The other one is the two Marys together. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they come, came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Now, this is what the account is saying. The account that they're saying, well, yeah, that, that document's accurate in, in its fact that it's a historical document, but perhaps they were hallucinating. This doesn't really sound like that's what's going on here, and there is no, no evidence for it. The next one is um, the witness went to the wrong tomb. You know, that, that's what happened. It was, they went to go to one tomb, but they got it wrong, and they ended up in the wrong place. Um, where is the evidence for that? Well, there's a flaw here. Jewish and Roman authorities would have shown them the right tomb, right? I mean, this, the answer is pretty simple. You know, we're just going to show you the right tomb since that happened. The tomb location was known to the Jews. It was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, and the Romans knew where it was because they did what? They placed guards there. You know, doesn't really, doesn't really fit, but this is perhaps. There's no evidence to this. It's really meant, like it's being used correctly. You show this evidence, and they go, well, perhaps this happened. So you show them another one. They go, well, perhaps this happened. You show them another one. They go, well, perhaps this happened. And it just goes on and on and on. And that's the way all these are kind of handled. There's no evidence for this, though. And so I feel kind of compelled to, to not go with this evidence, but go with this other evidence. 1 Corinthians 15.5, and he appeared to Cephas. And then to the 12. This is Paul writing this in a book that they regard as being historically 
You know, it's a real historical, authentic document written by Paul, who studied under Gamaliel, all of that. They believe that. And that's what he said. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And then in John 20, verse 8, Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw, and he believed. Remember, they said the Lord had risen. He gets there, and he, he was in a hurry. He wanted to see, is that true? Notice that, that they're not really convinced, though, by an empty tomb. They're convinced by the risen Lord. And they're going to check that out and investigate that. That It's kind of a silly argument, really, when you, when you think about it. They went to the wrong tomb. Um, that's not what's happening here. All right, then there is, you know, Jesus fainted. He didn't really die on the cross. I mean, after all, it is an exhausting thing. He, he swooned. It's the swoon there. It was an apparent death. He didn't really die. Jesus didn't die on the cross. He just fainted, and later he escaped from the tomb when nobody was watching. All right, there's some fatal some fatal flaws with this. Both enemies and friends believe that Jesus was dead. All right, it's not just the disciples that believe he's dead. I'll tell you someone else who believed they were dead was Jesus. Jesus believed that he was dead. Jesus knew he was dead. Um, Romans, well, they were professional executioners. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, let's, let's, are there any comments on this? What do you all know about this? I mean, the Roman guard, have you all ever looked at this? What do you think would happen? If the Romans were unsuccessful in carrying this out, let's give John a mic. If if you didn't perform your job 100% fully as a Roman executioner, you were the next one on the cross. Yeah, exactly. I did. You know, that's. I've, and the other thing, the also the historical evidence also shows, I mean, the biblical historical evidence shows he was pierced, you know, with a spear. I mean, I, I don't know too many people who are just going to faint, sticking up on a piece of wood with three large spikes, and then all of a sudden it's like seven or eight hours of sleep, figure they're just going to walk out of a tomb and run away somewhere. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're going to need some medical care. Herb's got a uh, comment, and Debbie. Up here, Luke. Um, is there any evidence that there was a? <laughs> sorry, I didn't know <laughs> that that it was it was normal for people to survive a crucifixion. No. Is that? No. I mean, is that even? <laughs> no, there's not. And that, that's why you would ask that question. Yes. Where are you getting your evidence? From? And so, one more question. To agree with what John said, when Paul was praying in the, you know, in the prison and the doors opened, those guards were getting ready to kill themselves. Right. Over, and that wasn't even over a crucif you know, a death. That was just prisoners escaping from, you know, who were already still alive. So, I mean, just saying, I'm agreeing. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to speak from a medical point because I've read the book, The <laughs> Medical right. Account of the Crucifixion, and... and with all the blood loss and fluid loss and dehydration that Jesus went through during the crucifixion, through the scourging and all, he, uh, they believe that he died of congestive heart failure. And when they pierced his side and the fluid came out, that was all the fluid that was around the pericardial sac. He would not have survived. Are you saying you don't have <laughs> enough faith to believe that he fainted? I don't have okay. enough faith okay. to and, think and, he And that's fainted. kind of the theme of the book. She doesn't have enough faith. Brian's got a comment on this. Yeah, and if, if he was, if it was a princess bride, you know, mostly dead, you know, sort of situation. Uh, he, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> he, he would have to be able to have the strength to roll the stone away from the inside, and, which is impossible from the and inside. And then overcome who? Overcome the Roman guards, right, the defeat guards, them all. Yep. And then somehow, in a, in, a ha in a mostly dead state, convince the disciples that he's a victorious risen Lord. I mean, they would have brought him to the hospital. But, you know, they, they would not have thought, oh, here's a victory. Here's someone victorious over death. Like they would see, he's yeah, they, at the. At they would have said something like, doorstop. "You might be alive, but you still need a doctor." <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it would. Uh, yeah, excellent point. He's not victorious in this, this at all. The way the response was, you know, and, and after Jesus' resurrection, thousands of people went to the hospital to visit him, you know, on a daily basis. That's not the way the story's told, is it, at all? 
He appears to 500 people, but they're not in the hospital when, when that event takes place. Um, it's, it's quite a different story. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight, Luke 24, verse 31. He says, see my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. This is after his death. As he appears, he's very confident in who he is, what he's saying. They're seeing it. They're in awe. They're in amazement. And, um, you know, those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, when they saw Jesus, they walked with him. They heard him. They heard him explain the scriptures. And later, Jesus invited them to touch him and to confirm that he was not a ghost. That's what happened there. And that, that account is, is like all the accounts of people encountering Jesus after. Um, the apostles saw him. They heard him speak. They were invited, obviously, to touch his wounds. You know, there's nothing, there's no magic. This isn't a trick. This is real. This really happened. I've always wondered when we see Jesus... Will he still have those scars? I mean, you know, will there be any evidence of that still? And what will that be like? I, you know, I don't know. Probably shouldn't have said that because I'm not prepared to answer that. Now, don't ever bring up a point you don't know anything about, you know, <laughs> um, which I just did. All right. So perhaps, oh, wait, there's one more. Jesus himself stood up among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And when he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Um, so perhaps it was something else. Perhaps the disciples stole the body. Perhaps that's what it is. And, and these conversations can go on for a while, by the way. These are the significant ones you hear. Did the disciples lie and deceive the whole world by stealing the body? Is that really what took place. There's a couple of problems with this. If the disciples stole the body, the writers would be liars and not deceived. Um, I like Brian's distinction. <laughs> the difference, somebody's calling a liar. He goes, wait, I might be deceived, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a liar. I'm not trying to deceive you. Um, this goes against all the evidence that the writers were honest, which everybody in the scholarly world is going, no, they're, they're telling what they believe they saw. They're being honest. For the most part, these guys are being sincere and honest about what they believe they saw and what they believe they encountered. We just disagree that that happened. Perhaps the disciples stole the body doesn't even fit in that conversation, yet this comes up. The disciples would have suffered and died for a lie that they knew was a lie if they stole the body. They would know it was a lie. We know what we did. We know what we did. And um, would they come clean? <clears throat> so, as we start to, to go through this, I, once again, I don't think there's enough for me to say, yeah, let's move that evidence, that evidence over. But then there's a problem with this. I'm going to move it over anyways, and here's why. Because the Bible actually does say this in Matthew 28, 13. His disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. <laughs> it says that. You, you can look it up. I'm not making this up. The only thing is, is the little ellipses there kind of give something else away. This verse is being pulled completely and utterly out of context, right? So let's see what it really says. It says, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into that city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers. This is a scandal. And said, tell the people, his disciples came by night and stole them away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. And I'm going to tell you, it's still being spread today. You will hear this story still told. And... You know, I think this is exactly what you show the person. You show, you know, that's actually in the Bible. <laughs> and you just take them right there and you show them the verse. You say, now let's read the whole thing. Let's see the context in which this happened. This is a bribe to go and lie and say that the disciples stole the body. So what I'm going to do with the little evidence marker I moved over for them, I'm going to take that back away because that's not really helpful either. So they don't really get that. I just don't really have enough evidence yet to be a skeptic based on 
the perhaps type of conversation that's there. Well, I have another one. You know, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. You know, later on, Jesus says, uh, just a couple of verses later, he says many other um, miracles that Jesus do uh, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe. You know, and the whole point was believing and having life in him. This, this is something that is the reason why we have it. The story we have is beautiful. The fact that it's written down for us to know these things shows the love of our God, the fact that he wants us to believe this and not disbelieve it. But, you know, people don't want to. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, and I like this one. Um, he stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And they said to him, children, uh, do you have any fish? And they answered him, well, no. So he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat. I'm sure when they heard that, they're already starting to go, I know what's going on here. Um, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because the quantity of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that would be John. John looks at Peter and says, it is the Lord. I mean, you know, we know what's going on here. We've been with him on a boat before. And when you're on a boat with Jesus, things that are supernatural, that are miraculous, can happen. Because he is the one that made everything. So is it unnatural for him? You know, not. it's part of who he is. From nothing, he created everything. And he has no problem having fish go into a fisherman's net. But perhaps a substitute took, took Jesus' place on the cross. It was a substitute. Well, this has happened before. You know the story. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865 at Forest Theater. But later on, we all find out that it was a substitute. And it was a big mistake. You all know that, right? It was a substitute. I'm telling you. Perhaps it was a substitute. You buy that one. If I say perhaps there was a substitute sitting next to Mary, and the person that was supposed to guard him, they just didn't know it was a substitute. Um, what's, what's troubling about, about this is um, this is the Muslim's explanation. All right, this is in the Quran. And uh, really? yes, it really is. <laughs> this is. This is their explanation, not Abraham Lincoln. Um, so, no, yes, Abraham, he comes out in the Quran. <laughs> No, that, that there was a substitute uh, and that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. Um, so, I don't know, have you all ever seen that, um, um, that, G, that uh, Abraham Lincoln, the website, or the, was it Facebook page? Abraham Lincoln's not really alive. Or, anyways, they make all these arguments that you make that would say that God's not real. They just say the same thing about Abraham Lincoln. And it makes people angry. You know, they're going, that's not true. You know, and anybody that believes that's an idiot. You know, and, and they make all these comments. And, you know, and, and then they say, you're just trying to do this because you're making some point about God. And they go, no, we're talking about Abraham Lincoln. And it's the same kind of thoughts. You know, this doesn't work. And sometimes we can laugh at that. No, we know what happened to Abraham Lincoln. The Muslim explanation, though, is that Jesus was not crucified. Someone else, like Judas, was killed in his place. Hmm. Um, the biggest problem, I'm just going to cut to the chase on this. For You can read this. It's in the book. Um, this claim from the Quran, you know, we talked about gaps, so this will mean something. It's made 600 years after Jesus' time. You know, just like I could say today, which isn't even 600 years, I could say <laughs> there was a substitute. Abraham Lincoln didn't really die. Everybody's going to go, that's not true. That's just ridiculous. We're not going to believe that. I think that's the strongest point. You know, it's 600 years. There's something more to the motive of why, but that's, that's the thought. But the truth is, is when they saw him, they worshiped him, and some doubted, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I love his explanation. That's obvious. I came back to life. I think that all authority, not some authority, not a little bit, but all authority has been given to me. That becomes very obvious at this point. When you're face to face with somebody who died and has now come back to life and is claiming, I am the Son of God. I did exactly what the Old Testament said I would do. I'm fulfilling these prophecies. And they're looking at it and they're writing about it and they're saying, this is when all that happened and every bit of it was real. But perhaps the disciples' faith led their belief in the resurrection. Um, 
I struggled with this one because of, of where it comes from. I'm going to not get into that part. Um, there's a, some of you are familiar with the Jesus Seminar. I'm just not well enough versed on the Jesus Seminar to speak uh, intelligently on it. I've heard my son mention, I know Brian probably uh, been in conversations with people about the Jesus Seminar. I, I don't get their point, but it's basically this idea that um, after searching the scriptures, the disciples made up the resurrection story, and they did this because they believed that persecution and execution was part of being God's chosen people. So they wanted to fabricate a story that had that element in it. So they did. And the idea is, is that their faith led to their resurrection belief. But the counter argument to this is just the opposite. The resurrection led to their faith. It's actually the other way around. It is the risen Lord. I say this here, I've said I believe a dead man came to life for a reason because that's the whole point. That's, that's going to occupy the biggest part of my faith. I, I believe a dead man came back to life. Um, that's not blind faith. So far, I keep looking at that purple line waiting for the evidence to move it. I'm going to tell you, there's blind faith on that slide, if you're going to be honest. It's, the, it's, the, it's that big purple gap, those little arrows that go from evidence to 100% proof. That's blind faith. There's not enough of it for me to be convinced by it. I don't have enough faith to be that kind of, kind of skeptic, not in the types of things that, that the skeptics bring up and they show. <clears throat> a couple more verses. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. This is another Paul thing, talking about some of them have fallen asleep, but some of them are still alive. He's very accurate in the way he writes. And he's obviously a scholar when he writes. They'll all agree to that. Um, and he definitely believes what he is writing. He was a persecutor of Christians. He converted and like most people who don't believe in something who later convert and do believe in God, they become very adamant about their position and very well versed and can speak about it pretty well. Also, we have uh, James. Um, did I miss James? I might have missed James. Maybe I moved the slide. Let me just see. Yeah. So we'll just stop on that one. Paul mentions Jesus appeared to a group of 500. Um, you know, there's many things that come out of 1 Corinthians. And then he appeared to James uh, and then to all the apostles. Was that actually on the slide? I don't remember. Yeah, he's on there. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Sorry, I see that. Um, perhaps, just perhaps, the New Testament writers copied pagan resurrection myths. You know, that's what they did. They went back, they read a bunch of old myth literature. They were trying to come up with something original. This theory can't explain the empty tomb, though. It can't explain the eyewitness, the martyrs, the non-Christian writings, or any of the other testimony that takes place. It fails to account for the evidence that is accepted by most scholars. Uh, it's really not, it's probably one of the weaker of the arguments. Early Jewish pagan critics recognized that the gospel writers were making historical claims. They weren't making mythological claims. They weren't making up legends. That's recognized by most of them. It's not that type of writing. It's more like an autobiography. If you really want to know the truth, a lot of the writings are, have that element to them as to Roman Greco, uh, autobiographical type, biography type writing. He's not doing any of that. What we have here is, you know, something that's made up perhaps is what I'm thinking. It's, is it just me or do you see the desperation in the argument? You know, you show them something, you read them a verse, and they go, well, perhaps it's this. And then you, you show them how that can, well, perhaps it's this. Because it's got to be anything, anything other than, no, God took on human flesh and died on a cross. And it's almost like it's a, it's a fight. <clears throat> and um, we, should, we should care about that. Now, as he went on his way, <clears throat> he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? The skeptic's about ready to change his mind. And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. 
I believe that happened. And I think evidence is essential for validating the claims and fostering objectivity, convincing others, guiding decision making, understanding truth, and building knowledge. Without validation, everything gets really complicated. Understanding is not complete. Assertions are going to fail. And without it, it is blind faith. So scholars have this disbelief. Why don't all scholars believe? Well, I think that there's a couple of ideas. Scholars' disbelief in the New Testament stems from a bias, mostly a bias against miracles. If you just really want to know what the heart and soul of this is, miracles. I'm talking big ones. I've never seen the ocean separate like that and people go through. You know, it's a bias against miracles. Somebody swallowed by a large fish, lived it, you know. It, it's a bias. And that's what the bulk of it is. But it's also similar to Darwinists. They just refuse to accept evidence that contradicts their views. Um, I'm just not, if it contradicts my view, I'm going to say, well, perhaps. You really pin one down. That was actually the pin down question. Where did life come from? We, you know, you're saying it can't be this and this and this and this. And the guy actually said, perhaps it grows on the back of crystals. I don't even know what that means. Neither did he when he said it. But you know, there's no evidence for that. But we're going to just throw that out there. Perhaps it started on the back of crystals. I'm smarter than you. I know about crystals, and you don't. You know, it's like I have no way to fact check that, and you haven't really provided any confirmation for that. I put the other blue bar up there because let's talk about for just a second while we end the class. Um, why do I believe? Why do I believe? Here it is. Right, Non-Christian sources affirming Jesus' crucifixion. We have Josephus, Tacitus, Talus, and the Jewish Talmud. They all confirm Jesus' crucifixion, crucifixion uh, countering theories that deny his death. We have Jewish leaders who did not deny the empty tomb but confirm it by trying to provide alternative explanations and went as far as bribing guards the claim that the, uh, the disciples stole the body is an implicit admission that the tomb was truly empty. Extraordinary nature of evidence in the New Testament offers more an early and detailed documentation than any other historical documents, historical events. It makes rigorous standards of historical evidence, and nothing comes close or compares to it. Historical miracles and predictions associated with Jesus, including the resurrection, were predicted in the Old Testament and witnessed by many, fitting into the theistic context of the universe. God made everything. It was created by someone who had the ability to take nothing and make everything from it. The resurrection is well supported that Jesus was risen, by, and this is seen by multiple eyewitnesses who saw what happened, and evidence from people who were uh, there who, who actually saw it that were involved in it. The accounts were written down not long after the events, making them historically reliable. Impact on the early Christians and the rapid growth of Christian movement despite persecution is difficult to explain without the resurrection. It is the fact that that resurrection takes place that many people come to Christ in a very short period of time. The transformation of Jerusalem was rapid as Christianity spread in the place where Jesus was crucified. Demonstrating the resurrection event was compelling enough to convince many, including all the formal skeptics that were, that were out there. Paul's conversion was a dramatic experience on the road to Damascus, where, and this is actually my favorite one. Um, it's very powerful. I'm, start, I'm starting to have a greater appreciation for that account. Um, experience on the road to Damascus where he encountered the risen Jesus. I think that's important. He encounters the risen Jesus. And this led from being Christianity's fiercest persecutor, too many words there, it's, uh, and to its most ardent advocate, willing to suffer and die for his faith. This is a strong evidence of his encounter with the risen Jesus. The conversion of James was initially skeptical, but he became a leader in the church there. It was in Jerusalem. All the martyrs um, is further evidence that the disciples were willing to die for their belief in the resurrection. It indicates their conviction in the truth of their testimony. Uh, this miracle of the resurrection and all other miracles are consistent with our theistic universe, making them plausible. Jesus' miracles were unique. They were instantaneous and witnessed by many. Brian pointed out in the book says they were bland, and I think that's an important thing. It's not a show, folks. It's a, this, is, this is making a, a much greater point than that. And then uh, change lives. Can you think of any event that changed more people's lives 
than this. Countless individuals throughout history have done that. Now, when I compare those two things, I just don't have enough faith to be an atheist. But I do have enough faith to believe in a risen Lord. And I really, it was in Brian's first class, when you threw that first chart up there, I've been thinking, I've been wanting to do this since you threw that up. That's touching. It's such a great way to explain it. And, you know, now you really got a grasp for why they called the book what they called it. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. When you understand how that goes together, you're going, this is a really simple, easy way to explain it. There's a lot of heavy lifting that you might have to do, but this is it. And okay, we're, we're, hold the bell. Tom, can we get Micah? That's okay. okay. Would you say then that you believe because it's true? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, I believe it because it's, it's true. Um, and it goes back to that uh, thing. I think, Brian, did you bring it up? I, Anne would never cheat on me. I'm 100% sure. Well, I'm not really 100% sure. But everything I know about Anne gets me to 99.999%. You know, it's, you know, it's, that, that's a hard concept, I know. It's like, well, Anne, now I'm going to be in trouble. Anne would never, you know, <laughs> how dare you say that about, I am, I am 100% sure. I'm changing my mind. Yes, it's absolutely true. I'm 100%. Um, anyways, that's the thought. Anybody else real quick? All right. Well, thank you. And, and uh, we'll get together on Wednesday and we'll talk about another. I, I'm looking for the next chapter. I've actually had this conversation. So thank you.